Look at that ski slope up there, that's cool. So we are just getting to MES here. There's Clayton's truck. All right, Clayton, what's the overall goal of the project here? The goal of the project is to show the farmer the downsides of some of the vacuum pumps on the market. So this thing was in use for a while? It was in use for three seasons. It did not complete three seasons. So roughly how many hours do you think are on this? I would say under 3,000 hours. Okay. That was a guess on that. And these things are designed in an industrial setting to go for tens of thousands of hours, right? Exactly. Yep. In more of a controlled environment. This is a dry screw pump. And being a dry screw pump, all of the components are aluminum. So the screws themselves are aluminum. And then the pump body itself is aluminum. Okay, uh, explain the chicken or the egg, or what, what got your interest about this? Um, so this pump was brought in, this pump was used in our test facility, and in the test facility it always saw high vacuum, it never saw low vacuum, it never had anything go through the pump. Very clean, clean pump. The timing belt appeared to be failed, but the failure didn't look like it came from the timing belt. And I know that sounds a little confusing, but... Generally, when a timing belt fails, you'll get weather cracking down the side of the timing belt, or you'll get some wear patterns. Maybe it was wearing on a pulley or something. This one looks like it was stretched. So what that does is it leads me to believe that the pump actually failed itself, and the timing belt was just collateral damage. So basically, the motor kept turning and snapped it. Exactly correct. Yep. All right. So part of that is you can see... Critics are gonna basically say, hey, a bunch of stuff went through the pump, you don't know anything about it. This is the intake of the pump, and you can see how crystal clear this is. Oh yeah, there's nothing in there. No, this was in an absolute, I eat off that. It's in a controlled environment. Um, there is a gas ballast valve in this pump, and the gas ballast valve actually is designed to bring some air into the pump and cool this. Being aluminum, we need some cooling factor on this, so we're not sure if Maybe the gas ballast valve failed. Maybe because it was such high vacuum and it wasn't getting air from the woods being cooled. The timing belt could have failed. But either way, the, there are no replacement parts. They'll tell you that bearings can be replaced and seals can be replaced. But when it comes down to actual failure on the screws, the pump body needs to be replaced and the screws need to be replaced. That's about a five to $6,000 project. So this machine, I, I believe, has a cleaning process, like a way to, at the end of the day, beginning of the day, I don't know if after a sap, I've heard that this is meant to be cleaned. Yeah, so our competitors are actually saying that it should be, you should put maybe simple green or whatever they're prescribing to go through the pump. However, where we saw the failure was down on the tighter tolerance end of the pump, not on the inlet of the pump. And you can see there's a little bit of brown staining on this pump but I'm gonna assume that's from maybe sap vapors carrying over at such a high vacuum. But you'll notice that as the screws compress, you don't see that down here at all. So that was crystal clean. So there could be, um, is this where there was galling? Yeah, so that's actually galling right there. There's a big lump in this screw. We actually tried to um, clean this up. We actually ground that down a little bit and we actually put it in the lathe to turn that just to clean it up to try it. It was, we knew this was gonna be a failure of a pump, but we just wanted to try and see if we could salvage something. Is there galling on every one of these? There is actually in the tighter stages, there's galling all the way down through. So no matter what, you can't like scrape that off. Not at all. It's not cleaning off, it's like metal. Exactly. Um, what makes me believe that the timing belt was collateral damage is because when we put this back together after cleaning it and grinding it down we had the same exact thing happen after when we fired it up it ran for about a minute and then it stopped itself dead and then the same reaction with the timing belt so you have special tools you had to purchase to work on this sure do so this tool set's about a 500 dollar tool set on the gears, so we have gears that are attached to the end of the screws. These guys are actually gears as well. And this is what is the timing mechanism. So between this part 
it's going to go right around and you can see how tight the tolerance is on that. So if you're off a little bit on your timing belt, you're going to have a collision. We also is have, this fixtured like it's not supposed to move? That's correct. What you do is you basically put this around the gears and then tighten, and then it, tighten it down so that it does not move. We also have this timing belt tensioner. So you think about tensioning and timing belt, you would take and measure deflection. There is no deflection in this timing belt tensioner. So what ends up happening is you actually pluck it like a guitar string and that gives you the frequency. So you can go ahead and pluck that guy. It'd probably take two plucks. Uh, do 29 hertz, give it a good one. Yeah. 31, I went up and two. In the manual it says that the hertz should be uh, 78. There's a range, but 78 comes to mind. So it's kind of a lot of trial and error. We're gonna assume that the manufacturer has some leeway for belt stretch and whatnot. So this timing uh, mechanism was about it's about 500 bucks for this and this was about 500 dollars. so for both exactly so so the guitar tuner is 500 or whatever combined it's 500 bucks got yep. you and i would say the timing belt's a couple hundred dollars so just to change the timing belt you're going to be in it the first time around 700 plus dollars got you and that's assuming you have the bravery to do it yourself yeah i wouldn't after seeing what i see now they're basically a disposable pump. There is an issue with any part of it. You throw it away and you start again. Gotcha. So you think if you spent ten, twelve thousand dollars on the pump, and you have a failure, you're going to spend another six thousand dollars on that pump. So the inside of that chamber of the pump element yeah, there. Let's take a peek. You can see here there's scratching and galling all the way down this. Which ends which? So this is the high compression end. This is okay. actually where everything comes out. And now it should be smooth. I wish we could convey this on camera, but it is. There's a lot of chunks and ridges and. Oh my. All the way down. Oh yeah, that one's a good one there. That's yeah. a good one. That's probably where. It that's like a dead. gash. Yeah, that's where it stopped dead for sure. Yeah. And this so pump it's... right here is a libel vacuum pump. So it actually has a light bulb sticker on it. This was an early serial number model. So we're not sure maybe they had an issue with the pump itself and they've corrected those actions. Um, or if this is just kind of what you're gonna get when you run a dry screw pump in maple. Gotcha. So have you run screw pumps before? Yeah, we run um, wet screws. We call them wet screws, the GHS, which is a steel screw pump. So it uses steel screws and it uses oil. Are they stainless? They're not stainless, they're steel. Wow. Yep. Now that's what, uh, you've had a lot of years on the one at Dan Crocker's, right? Yeah, that's going on a long time. Yeah. And so they're made for industry, they're made for 40, 80,000 hours of use. So that's not made for like one or two sugar seasons, they're made for a very long time. Cool. What are you doing with this pump? We're throwing it in the dumpster. <laughs> yep. Has zero use. So you wouldn't even try to rebuild this? Not at all. Even to save a dime? Nope. 